Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the results by the Bushel webinar by BSF. Thanks for joining us here this morning. I'm Sean Haney, founder of RealAgriculture.com and host of Real Ag Radio. You can hear every weekday on Rural Radio 147 on Sirius XM. I'm going to be your moderator today for the discussion. Today, you'll be hearing about results, what they mean to growers, how they achieve them, and a few tips from a BSF specialist as well. As you know, canola is a high-value cash crop that constantly features innovation that will continue to grow its potential long into the future. Sometimes it can be difficult to keep up and make the most of these growing conditions. Growing canola is not easy. Today's webinar is all about getting the most of your investments and hard work. The panel members will each discuss anything that gives them the upper hand in their fields, including seeding practices, integrated pest management strategies, pod shatter reduction technology, and, in, in, and any other innovation or practice they feel gives them the edge over challenges in the field. So here's the panel. Here's what we're going to hear from today. We're going to hear from Harold Brown. He's a BSF technical service specialist. Harold has a rich history of getting results in the field. He's worked in research, market development, and technical service positions for over 25 years. So Harold has really done it all. Harold will take us through the innovation journey of Invigor Hybrid Canola and speak to some key points on stewardship results and supportive data essential for decision making on the farm. We're also going to hear today from a couple farmers that are going to provide great insight as well. We're going to talk to Gunther Yoakum. He owns and operates Blue Diamond Farms. As someone who lives near Winnipeg, Gunther is no stranger by <laughs> to weathering the storm. His likes include advocating for agriculture and its sustainability his family, and he's quick with the Twitter fingers as well. He very much dislikes cold winters, which probably has a ton to do with the fact he lives so close to Winnipeg. Also, we're going to talk to Terry. Terry is passionate about family, farming, and the future. He runs a 15,000-acre grain farm. A he's a professional independent agronomy consulting company and ex is also very, very interested in expanding sustainable solutions with a business that he is also running with his brother. With one hand in charity work and another in ag education, Terry gives back just as much as he gets from the industry that he very much loves. As you can see, it's going to be a lively discussion today, so let, let's get going here and uh, get moving. So I'm going to pass it over to Harold, and, and Harold, you've been involved with Invigor for quite a while. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the innovation that you've seen over time? Well, thank you, Sean, and good morning, everyone. It's great to be here this morning. And uh, yes, I'm Harold Brown, and I uh, am a technical service specialist, and I'm in, based in eastern Manitoba, just to get to give you a bit of an idea where I spend most of my time. And yes, I've been working with Invigor for quite some time. I just had my 15-year anniversary, uh, but it started much before that, as you can see in this chart here. Back in the early 80s, when we developed the proprietary hybridization system that really allows us to produce the high quality Invigor seed that we do today, uh, registering our first Invigor hybrid in uh, 1997, and discovering pod chatter reduction trait in 2000. And I'll touch on that a bit more in a minute. But when I joined uh, the team, Really, it was just when we launched the 5000 series. And I cut my teeth on hybrids like Invigor 5030, 5070, and 5020. And I got to know and understand those hybrids really well and their high performance that they had. But it wasn't that long. It was only a couple of years later in 2008, we introduced Invigor 5440. And that was a hybrid I wasn't um, all that excited about, to be honest, when I first saw it. It uh, didn't look as exciting, I thought, as the other hybrids, and it eh, yielded about the same that year when we first saw it. But that was a hybrid that went on to really uh, gain wide acceptance and planted on uh, significant acreage over the next 10 years. And then another one I wanted to highlight was in 2014, we launched L252. That was the first hybrid that came along that actually consistently out yielded 5440. And that hybrid really replaced it and gained wide acceptance again. We also in 2014 introduced the first pod shatter 
reduction trade hybrids, and that was L140P, and it was quickly replaced by L233P, so uh, a new hybrid that at that time uh, was with the pod shatter trait and a new level of yield and consistency, as well as with each time of the introduction of these new hybrids came with those traits, but also new disease packages uh, to help combat uh, changing diseases out there in the environment. And that brings us to uh, today, where we introduce the uh, 300 series, the Invigor 300 series, uh, in the last year and this year. A couple other important points was back in 2011, the first uh, clubbert resistant hybrid, L135P and uh, C, sorry. And then in 2020, this year, we in introduced the, the new package sizing where uh, targeted seeding rate with that. So today, uh, with the clubbert resistance that I just mentioned, it is uh, significant disease of concern across Western Canada and been more demand for those hybrids uh, with uh, the clubbert resistant trait. So now in uh, 2021, we expect about 60% of our portfolio will have that trait. And um, I wanted to point out our new uh, 300 series hybrids that have that clubbert resistant trait. And this is first generation resistance, which is uh, the initial resistance that was introduced. It's uh, perfect uh, for most of Western Canada where you're looking for that trait. And there's L345PC uh, that was introduced last year, uh, was in our DST programs last year and had fantastic yield and performance. This year we introduced uh, L340PC, another hybrid uh, with that same clubbert resistance and pod shatter reduction trait. And there was L352C, a swathing hybrid with good performance, and LR344PC. So if you're looking for uh, glyphosate resistance as well, that hybrid brings uh, that package as well. With, um, the other thing to point out is uh, if you are looking for second generation resistance for clubroot, you would need L234PC. So that's a specialist really for that clubroot uh, zone where they've been dealing it with it for a number of years where the first generation is maybe broken down or you've been dealing with club root for some time. So what about the pod shatter reduction trait? This has uh, brought about a real revolutionary change in uh, harvest flexibility. So for allowing straight cutting and all the benefits of that, but also flexibility for swathing. So the one hybrid that's new that uh, of the 300 series I didn't mention is L357P. So it comes with that trait, doesn't have club root, but it has exceptional yield potential and it has great standability and a great uh, black lake package. So that's another hybrid I wanted to mention in the 300 series. Now pod shatter uh, reduction trait, um, it uh, works hand in hand with having um, redu reduction of pod drop. So you also have a careful balance. It took uh, a lot of years to get that balance uh, down for pod shatter reduction that you have uh, holds those pods together on the plant, but when it goes through the combine, it threshes. And then pod drop, you, you don't really have a benefit there unless it stays on the plant. So it was a careful balance. and. Something you may not know is that we slide trays into many of our trials uh, to assess that every year. And they go in at 60% seed color change and stay till just before the combine goes through. And here's an example where we had hail uh, when plants were mature. Some of our competitors on the right showing the pods that fell into those trays and on the left with 345 PC um, showing how so good that, that is handling that type of uh, conditions in the fall. Not saying, saying they're hail resistant, but there's a benefit, definite clear benefit there. So what happened this season? That's um, 2020 was uh, really significant for a number of things and uh, weather was uh, another one of them. I just wanted to go through a little bit about the weather conditions we had this year and how it affected canola production in Western Canada. It really started out rather cool and dry across 
uh, most of Western Canada. And if you look at this in the top left corner, the um, certain areas of Western Canada started to get moisture. This is the uh, amount of moisture percent of normal that occurred in um, the month of June. And some areas stayed very dry. If you look at the, the yellows to reds, uh, the southern prairies in general stayed quite, quite dry, but there were pockets in northwest uh, Manitoba and uh, northern Saskatchewan, northwest Saskatchewan into Alberta that received quite heavy downpours, uh, significant precipitation that caused a lot of challenges and it arrived in many areas like in northwest Manitoba that I'm familiar with where uh, the canola was just starting to bolt and flower. So heavy downpours caused some lodging, caused damage, entry points for disease and uh, that was significant. So uh, the weather was really causing some challenges and in increasing uh, lodging and disease uh, that we were later seeing in the season there. It was starting to warm up. Um, if you look on the right hand chart uh, in southern uh, Red River Valley, days above 25, we were starting to get a little warm towards the end of June. And then if you look at the bottom um, on the left, the southern prairie stayed very hot and dry. Uh, things dried out um, and also you can see the number of days above 25 it was hot and dry and windy. I live in Winnipeg and I'm used to wind but that was the windiest year uh, apparently since in the last 12 years I saw some weather data. So what does that do? It favors this all these conditions favored earlier maturing hybrids particularly across the southern prairies and uh, because of that wind, hot, dry conditions, there's a little more uh, shatter and pod drop because of those conditions. In the northern prairies where there was more moisture, later maturing hybrids uh, were allowed to mature fully and reach their potential. So overall there was really a general trend to earlier maturing hybrids had really getting to their yield potential and having a bit of advantage over the late maturing hybrids. So a few points um, with all of these learnings from this year is that um, conditions are never have two years the same. But some real tips is trying to utilize an integrated pest management management program, an IPM program you may have heard about. So extending rot your rotation, if at all possible, will help. It helps reduce the inoculum, and that's the number one best way uh, to reduce disease in your fields. Controlling volunteers, you may not think about this, uh, but can volunteer canola when it's growing in other crops will uh, can develop those diseases. Uh, they may not be resistant, they're F2 uh, canola and um, just controlling them is um, important. And then in the cro canola crop as well, if you have a tight rotation, you have more canola volunteers that aren't really the hybrid you planted. Scout and know what uh, your infection levels are. And lastly, utilize the newest R-rated hybrids. We at BSF, our breeding team is constantly introducing new traits uh, for disease resistance. And that's really important uh, for combating this. So trying uh, introducing new uh, our newest hybrids with the uh, latest resistance traits. So I'm moving into some results. I'll talk to you a little bit about our uh, my program and I work in technical service and there's a lot of us that uh, support um, Invigor Canola and uh, I'm one, just one of them and part of a huge team of us uh, across Western Canada. And um, I manage the demonstration strip trial program. Some of the key factors here, uh, key points about it, is that this is the first time uh, we get to put our latest hybrids in the hands of growers to try. So uh, this is uh, allows them to get uh, a feel for how they perform on their farms. And uh, we help them along the way. So it is uh, fertilized, lands prepped, uh, right through to swathing, harvesting. The grower is doing that, but we help them along the way. We try to keep this to a 
We do keep it to a smaller portion of the field where there's uniformity because we don't want there to be soil characteristics that would favor one hybrid over another. It's also replicated so we can do some basic statistics. And that's one last check that we have. We can run at the end of the year to make sure there's not var variability showing up at the end of the uh, season. Um, and if there is too much variability, we have stringent uh, checklists. Uh, a trial could be canceled if there's something outside of our uh, control that has uh, affected the performance in the trial. You can see here uh, my summer student uh, doing some plant counts. So we do assessments of vigor right through to lodging, uh, maturity. Our uh, growers help us do harvestability and swathability ratings and uh, right through to harvest where that is uh, summarized and uh, posted to our website. This is just a, a map showing our planned trials and we try to cover all canola growing regions across Western Canada and there's probably a location there close to you. I just uh, wanted to touch a little bit on our results this year. Lots of numbers on this chart but I'll focus you in a couple of important ones. Um, the names on the left are all the hybrids we had in Vigor as well as our competitors that were in these trials. On the right in this red box is the number of trials that we had that uh, hybrid in. This is uh, our straight cut trials, so it's a portion of all the trials that we do. Um, and then another thing to focus on is the left. So this, uh, this left column, and th this isn't reporting yield because that can vary across Western Canada. It's reporting how consistent um, how they performed in the top three. So if you look at our new hybrids like L345 PC, it was 70% of the time in the top three. So it was consist doing very well for consistency and yield. L340, our new hybrid, 85% of the time. Uh, 233 performed, L in vigor, L233 performed uh, very well again, um, 81%. And I mentioned why, because of the kind of growing season we had really favored early maturing hybrids like that one. 340, 350, L357P, uh, is a later maturing hybrid with the five in the middle um, of the name. It uh, still had a very good showing, but um, a little bit lower than the others. Point is, if you look at the competitors, they are at much different level. So they're high yielding hybrids as well, but they weren't placing in the top three uh, for high yield and consistency like uh, our hybrids. I just wanted to touch briefly on other teams that help us do this work. Our agronomic excellence team uh, is a group across Western Canada that does uh, more internal work. Um, these are highly replicated trials, but they're using tools like you're familiar with to seed right through to harvest. That data is also rolled up along with ours into our Invigor Results website. And you can go into that website, invigorresults.ca, to look for those um, trials and look at all the results. It's all posted there, even things like lodging and our agronomist comments. Lastly, a tip of the hat to our breeding team. If without them, we wouldn't have our new hybrids to uh, introduce and with uh, new yield uh, potential and uh, traits like disease, the new disease uh, packages that we have. And those are another, it's another um, thing to look at when you're tr trying to introduce new hybrids, some information that you might be looking for. You'll see it like this one here, always compared to percent of checks in a WCCRC. So those are the registration trials. You can see this is highly replicated, main, managed. Uh, trials. This is our breeding farm in Saskatoon. I also wanted to mention third-party data is important for you to look at. This is hot off the press, the canola performance trials for this year. Small plot data um, shows the performance versus uh, of, uh, in this case, the straight cut hybrids. And uh, here's our three of our Invigor uh, hybrids here on the left, showing great performance there. The last thing I wanted to mention is that um, 
recommendations for top performance on your farm. Don't expect next year to be like 2020. Um, every year is different. Spread your risk. Consider multiple hybrids on your farm. Consider introducing new hybrids with a new genetic uh, resistance for disease. Think about the fields that you have on your farm and what characteristics of those hybrids are better suited for different areas. And lastly, the good ag agronomics. Um, integrated pest management uh, with, that I discussed earlier, target plant population, uh, five to seven plants per square foot that we recommend gives you optimum yield in the end of the season and uh, watch for, for volunteers. So with that, I'll turn it back to Sean. Hey, great stuff, Harold. I, you know, great advice. No two years are the same. And, you know, maybe across the span of a couple decades, yeah, there's years that feel very similar and we like to reminisce about the different years, but, uh, it's always interesting, though, in the short term, you, know, you say don't expect 2021 to be like 2020, but it's a natural that we, we sort of do that. It's sort of like a human condition. It, it, it takes some discipline to, to, to not do that. Okay, uh, we're going to move on now to our farmers. And I want to mention, though, if you do have questions for Harold, he's going to be here throughout the whole webinar. At the back end, we're going to have a Q&A period where you can ask Harold some, some questions along with our other panelists as well. So uh, get those questions ready. Hey, let's start with Gunther. Uh, Gunther, uh, you're always trying to be on the cutting edge, maybe the, the bleeding edge sometimes, some may call it. Uh, what, does, what does being innovative look like on your farm? Uh, being innovative on our farm, what does that look like? That's a good question. It's, uh, and you're right. It being at that cutting edge, uh, sometimes you bleed a lot. So it, it has many forms, innovation, uh, whether it's equipment, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, tractors, for example. On our farm in 89, we switched from wheel tractors to tracks and been farming using uh, track tractors since, switched our combine to track uh, equipment and, uh, and grain carts and so on. Um, seeders went from diskers to air seeders to air drills to finally air disc drill and with independent openers and then uh, uh, we're, we're just always looking for ways to become more efficient and and make things easier on the farm and that way hopefully become more profitable and that also involves uh, seed you know, we want the latest technology in seed and in, um, uh, in 1985, we, we ventured into straight cutting our crop because it was a very wet year. We straight cut a lot of, uh, wheat that year and we did a quarter section of canola. Uh, we only had a, a rickety old pull type swather. Uh, the canola was lodged severely. Uh, cut about 80 acres of that quarter section and the other 80 acres we, we just let it ripen on its own and straight cut it and loved it it, it was amazing you know and uh, but then we went back to you know just swathing uh, made the move to straight cutting canola about uh, 10 years ago we, we really pushed into that and of course, there was no straight cut varieties at the time, so it was uh, lots of hit and miss. If if you had a canola crop that was standing really nice, it was very prone to shattering, and and so we had some some bleeding moments on that innovation. That's for sure, you know, uh, losing 10, 15, 20 bushels uh, an acre, and it, it was it was a tough lesson. But uh, once uh, the L one forty P came out. We uh, took the step, sold our swather, and been straight cutting canola ever since. So the the pod shadow reduction trait sounds like is uh, pretty important to your harvesting plan. Uh, very important. It's uh, we we won't grow a canola on our farm that doesn't lend itself to straight cutting. Uh, we we can't take that hit. You know we. We push our canola, we push all our crops that we grow agronomically. And so it, it costs a lot of money to grow those crops. And you can't have that 
10 bush on acre uh, hit. It, it just, that it doesn't work. Okay, but how, how have those hybrids performed under different environmental conditions? You've been doing it over a number of years here. Like we talked about with Harold, every year is different. So what's been the experience? Every year is different. Uh, we actually really liked L140. It maybe had some weak legs, but we liked it because we, we even when we swathed canola and had good swaths, we could have severe losses if it wasn't rolled properly, uh, severe winds scattered all over the place. Um, and then, you know, they came out with 233, the 200 series pod shatter. It, uh, that was definitely a step up and uh, the yields are there. And we just, we, we can push those varieties and, and, um, it, it it's just it works now you kind of you gave us some examples of innovation on your farm I think you kind of cherry-picked a little bit you didn't share where they didn't work out because you know switching to you know some of the technology you talked about yeah the, in hindsight yeah those were smart choices but what about some of the things you tried that that didn't work that you were kind of really really failed and and how did you manage your way through that Right, so stuff that didn't work. Uh, straight cutting 252 didn't work. Uh, that that was one of the years that we uh, lost uh, about 20 bush on acre. We had we had harvested about 40 acres of a quarter section, and then we had a bad windstorm, a little bit of hail in there too. Came back, the rest of the field complete disaster. That's that's hitting it right on the chin. Um, you know, those would be the severe ones where you really sit back and go, "Holy crap! Okay, this <laughs> this is not working. We we need we need something better, right? If we're gonna do this straight cutting thing." One more thing on the seeding equipment side, for example, you know, we see it with discers. One of the biggest changes we did one year was. Uh, uh, we bought a press drill with independent openers to uh, to set each uh, row depth independently, and uh, we we used that concept for two years, and it just didn't work because we had to work the land beforehand to make it work, and it worked really good one year. The following year, it was a complete disaster across the whole farm, and that's those are tough wake up calls. So, yeah, for sure. Okay, let's move over to uh, Terry Aberhart. Terry, I got some questions for you here before we get to the Q and A section with the audience. Uh, I know you're always trying to achieve maximum results. You're always trialing new stuff. That's w always what's going on over there at Aberhart Farms. What what kind of tools do you integrate to help you get there in terms of achieving those high results? Yeah, awesome. Well, first of all, I'm glad you didn't ask me about what didn't work as well because we probably have to extend the webinar with most of our experiences on the farm here. But yeah, when it comes to maximizing results, I mean, first of all, we, we look at, me you have to measure something in order to maximize it. So we do focus a lot on just data acquisition, tracking everything that we do on the farm. We've obviously been big with the consulting business on implementing precision technologies that's something that I'm really passionate about. So we're just always looking to, to take whatever new innovation um, or opportunity may be out there to continue to, to push the agronomic boundaries, so to speak. We like to be at the leading edge, but stay away from the bleeding edge a little bit there if we can, although sometimes things bleed a bit too. But uh, yeah, generally speaking, we, just, we really look to always be learning and and leveraging um taking in things like this webinar maybe learning from others around you and implementing those things and then testing the results so do you do you how, how do you approach those those new things do you sort of sort of drip them out where you know maybe you you do it on you know try a product or a hybrid on a on a smaller piece of ground and just kind of give it a shot and see how it works or you know how, how do you approach it 
Yeah, it probably depends on the situation or the approach. I mean, first of all, we would do as much research as we can and learning about uh, maybe the tool or technology and how we might want to implement it. I kind of been burnt a few times from doing the large, um, larger trials initially um, and, and learning to be a little bit, uh, especially when you're running a few more acres, it's sometimes hard to do a smaller trial that's a little less risk. Um, but so we've, depending on the situation, we do try to manage our risk a bit, but we also try to do things over multiple years and, and a wide enough scale that um, we can build confidence around, around the result or the technology that we might be working with. Yeah, replication over multiple years. Like, like you know, Harold said, no two years are, are the same. So you, you mentioned managed risk. So how do you approach managing risk? Yeah, well, there's lots of different ways to, to look at risk, but um, essentially one of the first things we do is just through our strategic planning, you know, um, setting our goals and what we want to do. Um, on the crop operation side, I mean, a lot of it has to do with looking at what's been successful, um, trying to manage rotations, um, not jump too far into to one thing at a time. And um, so I, I think that a lot of times when you, when you talk about risk management on a farm, there's a lot of talk about diversification. And I think that's really important. On the same hand, I believe a form of diversification is being exceptional or really good at, at what you do or, or attempting that. So we all know there's lots of farms out there that are, are just really, really good at, at the things that they do. And so whether it's agronomically, um, trying to do everything right, growing the right um, varieties, hybrids, um, using the best agronomic approaches, uh, leveraging technology, all those things help mitigate your risk. And a lot of precision farming is about um, putting, allocating inputs where you're most likely or highly likely to get a return and not allocating inputs where you're most likely not going to get a return or the risk is high. So that's a lot of the ways that, that we look at trying to manage risk overall. So in terms of selecting a new hybrid, you know, there's a lot of information to take into consideration. Harold kind of went through some of that. What, what information do you look at, Terry, when you're evaluating a hybrid on whether or not you're going to plant it on your farm? Yeah, so I mean, we've been big fans of, of the Invigor brand. Um, a, a lot of what we look at for selecting hybrids is actually straight cutting now as we be, become big fans of that and we don't have a pickup header or a swather on the farm anymore either. But it, it really comes down to consistency um, and, and trust. So I mean, we're always looking for the next variety that that can get us where we want to, but it it's goes beyond just yield alone. I think a lot of times we can easily get focused on yield because that's exciting to, to be able to tell your neighbors or the coffee shop what your yields were and that they were great, but really we look at kind of the whole agronomic packet, package, you know, how does it, how does it um, come out of the ground, how does it handle the growing season, harvestability, and uh, disease package and those kind of things with, with club root becoming more of a concern. So really we're kind of looking for, you know, an overall package um, in that variety and, and what just will have a good fit for our farm over the long term. I can see someone like yourself really pushing people like Harold to get you the information you need to make that decision, like being a little bit pushy about it and you know, challenging them a little bit to be really on their toes and have their sharpest game. Yeah, for sure. I haven't I haven't had the pleasure working with Harold, but Alana uh, Luchuk is is our uh, gal for this part of the world. And yeah, we've we've worked a lot with the DST program over the years. It's been an excellent experience. It's one of the reasons why I do have confidence in in the results. Um, is I know how they run the DST program. I've been a part of that. I think it's it's really good to experience that. Um, on your own farm and yeah I'm always kind of bugging Alana I didn't this is one of the first years we didn't have a DST on our farm for various different reasons but yeah I'm still always phoning Alana and bugging her for uh, insider information and what her experience is out in the field so I, I think you know there's a lot of great reps out there and uh, they have a lot of great experience in the field and it's it's great to to you know leverage that information as much as you can uh, or they allow you to anyways. 
Yeah. Well, I'm going to bring Harold back in here. Uh, Harold, so we've clearly, we, we talked about, you know, there's always new innovations coming, new hybrids with, you know, new and improved traits and characteristics. But should I, as a farmer, feel pressure that I have to plant that newest variety that is being released? Or can I still, am I still okay to go with something that's been on the market for maybe two years and I'm really happy with it because it's really performing in, in my area, on my farm. How do I approach that? <laughs> that reminds me of uh, when I started out working with Invigor, I had mentioned becoming comfortable with what had been working well and uh, having new things introduced, that uh, new hybrids introduced that I needed to try. And I think that should go uh, on the farm as well. I'm really a proponent um, to trying new hybrids. Uh, there are a number of reasons to do that uh, that I had mentioned. There's always the next level of yield, which Terry had says is nice bragging rights, but it does pay the bills. But it's uh, what comes along with it, the new disease package is uh, really important to stay ahead of um, uh, evolving diseases. So don't jump in. Um, I don't recommend jumping in and planting the whole farm to a brand new hybrid. Try um, one or two and see how they perform. Even put them up side by side, split a field so you have a good understanding of how they compare and how they perform. Um, those are some tips I have, but I do recommend even though uh, maybe you've only been growing them for a few years, uh, it's good to, once things are comfortable, it's probably time to try something new. <laughs> yeah, well, the life cycle of the varieties is, is turning, you know, faster and faster, right? So a, an old hybrid, you know, when we look back 20 years ago, we have a different definition, I think, of old hybrid uh, than, than we did previously. Uh, what we're going to do is get to the Q&A where the audience gets to ask some questions they may have for the panel. Uh, if you do have a question, I encourage you to ask it. Please also uh, state your location so we have a good idea and give us some context of which province you are in. That would be greatly appreciated by, by our panelists. Uh, we'll keep going here while we're waiting for some questions. Uh, Gunther, what do you see as the next big game changer in terms of innovation on your farm? Uh, the next big game changer. Yeah. <laughs> that's... Uh, that's that's a good question. You know, uh, human resources is always uh, an issue on, on every farm, I think, especially seasonal uh, help. So I, I uh, like to really look out far, and I, I like uh, automation, like robotics, uh, AI, uh, you know, the dot technology, um, that, that kind of stuff. That, that's what really has me excited. Um, yeah. Gun Gunther in a lawn chair with a cold one on the edge of the field, <laughs> just watching that planter go around and around and around. I can see now it. you're talking, see? <laughs> Plus, you need a, a whole host of technicians to keep it going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Somebody called an electrician. Uh, Terry, what about you? I think for us, uh, what we're working with more and, and getting excited about is what I kind of like to call it you, the use of intelligent data. So I think there's some great examples. Um, one is uh, the crop intelligence system that South Country created using the weather station. So we've heard a lot about big data and that's getting a little bit old and tired over the years. But where I think it becomes valuable is when you can take that data and put it into decision-making um, reports are, are simplified in a way that it's easy to make uh, decisions, in-season decisions or profitable decisions from that. And so th those are some of the things that we're getting excited about, um, split applying nutrients and basing that based off of the potential throughout the year within your soil and what the weather stations are showing you. Um, I also think we're just kind of at the forefront of, of AI, you know, really um, starting to have a, a big impact in, in agriculture. I mean, it's already around us all over, whether we know it or not, when we, you know, talk about this diet or that and all the ads come up on Instagram, um, we know that's coming there for a reason. 
And yeah, so I think there's some incredible technologies um, coming to, to agriculture, like green on green spraying and all these different things. And, and there's so much data that we're dealing with. Uh, essentially, we're all, we're all um, collecting a huge amount of data, but relatively speaking, we still haven't leverage that yet um, within within the industry and so you know I think that's exciting and and the autonomy thing I mean it's 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 coming it's um, it's on its way it's already out there in in some forms or fashion and most of this technology will always seem farther out initially and then the adoption will will usually surprise us how how rapidly it comes and I think that's going to start to happen with with that part of the world with robotics yeah. and autonomy and in different ways in agriculture so those, so those are the things that I'm excited well, about. Well I think Terry those you know your answer and Gunther's answer they tie together and because a lot of times when we talk about robotics we think about the labor component as Gunther ha had mentioned but it's also that robot is collecting data and use the example of a robotic milker in a dairy situation it's doing the work of the milking but it's also collecting a tremendous amount of information on each of those cows to allow you to make better decisions. And when you put those two together, the AI like you talked about, that, that's a pretty uh, formidable tool. So pr pretty cool stuff. Uh, as I mentioned, we, got, we can take some questions from the audience. I encourage you to type them in with your location. We got a question here from uh, Curtis. He wants to know what successful crop rotation innovations have these growers implemented and what crops have they tried that they'll never try again? Uh, Terry, you first. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, so yeah, with, with rotations, I mean, obviously we're trying to put as much rotation into into our uh, operation as possible. Um, that's sometimes a challenge, but we always try to grow some pulses. So we've grown peas and faba beans and played around a bit with soybeans. Um, We've grown uh, flax and stuff in the past, so generally we're spring wheat, canola, barley, some pulses, and I'm usually always trying to play around with the, something else to, to learn because I always worry that if something drastically happened with canola disease or issues like that, we need to we need to be prepared for that. But um, done some intercropping, um, grew some hemp and for uh, seed and for CBD. So. I don't know if there's anything that I absolutely wouldn't try again. I, I think never say never is kind of a, a bit of my motto, but <laughs> I think that, you know, definitely been uh, a little bit more cautious towards the, even like the CBD thing with hemp was like super, super exciting and getting a lot of people revved up a year or so ago. We were fairly cautious. That was the first time I was a little bit overly cautious with how much we grew. Um, because of our experience in the hemp seed industry and I was really glad that we did that because it's you know not moving quite as well as we would like or whatnot but yeah just lots of different stuff always looking for for um, what to try I guess the one thing that we may not try again for a while is corn we grew corn for a couple years and uh, that's just not quite ready yet for our area here and our um, yeah. setup but Good there, how about you we've uh, grown 12 different uh, crops uh, in the last 40 years, but the last five years we've really honed in on canola, soybeans, wheat, and oats, and uh, that rotation works really well. We we try to have uh, that, yeah a three to four year rotation with canola. Uh, I really don't want it any tighter than that. We had uh, we had one field this year where we had a six year rotation, and it was by far the highest yielding. Uh, there was no disease in it. It, it was a beautiful crop. Uh, crops that I would never grow again um, is probably, I, I, it's like Terry said, I don't know if there is such a thing, but uh, same thing with corn. Even though there's lots of corn grown around me and quite successfully, um, my farm is not set up for it. I don't have the desire right at the moment to set up for corn. So that's that's the one crop I'm not pushing. And never say never. If there's a market, uh, farmers exactly. will grow it. We have proven that over and over and over again. Uh, Harold, got a question here from Eric. I'm going to throw to you. How has the Invigor health line performed? There seems to be a lack of information to be found in the trials. And will this trait continue? Will this be a trait you continue on developing? 
So thanks for the question. Um, with the um, Invigor Health line, it is, uh, a, of course, a specialty product line. So we don't do as many trials on it in our program each year, so you won't find it um, individually reported, but it does get rolled up and we do report on it that way. It is, a, um, I think, a good consistent performing hybrid. Um, it's not going to be our top yielding hybrid in our trials, but it's always right in there with the, I like to say it's in there with the rest of our Invigor hybrids. It is, um, as far as a trait, I believe we are continuing to develop uh, new hybrids with that, um, with that trait as well. But um, I, we haven't introduced a new one for a couple of years now. Okay, uh, we got Harold Rapid Fire here. More questions coming in for Harold. Uh, is there a the question here from Taylor? Is there a timeline for any new second generation club root varieties? That's a good question. Uh, I know there's demand for some new ones, and uh, and our breeding team is working hard on that. And I'm hoping that we will have something to test in the near future. Okay. Uh, Adam and Dylan have very similar questions. Does BSF select at all for sclerotinia resistance in their breeding program? Mm, that's a good question. Some of you may remember we were working on particular resistant varieties at one time. Um, but, uh, and I know it's, I believe it's still part of our program. So I would say we do uh, look at that as far as resisting, res registering Resistant varieties uh, or hybrids, I haven't seen any coming uh, recently, but um, one of the focuses we did have is doing agronomic trials. Uh, it was part of the Invigorate research, so finding optimum um, targeted plant stands uh, helps prevent uh, diseases like that, as you don't get as much uh, dense architecture and uh, lodging, etc., that can uh, increase sclerotinia issues. So that's another um, consideration to look at as well. Okay, question uh, for Terry. When you're trying a new variety in your farm and it doesn't perform the way that you expected it to, do you give it a second chance the year following or do you move on to something else? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I do believe you need to to test things over multiple years. It, it probably depends on, you know, maybe how poorly it, it performed, if it did perform per, poorly, and, and maybe what the reason is. But, yeah, I think a lot of times we see that sometimes, even, even this year, there was a certain, you know, wheat variety that's been really successful in our area. Um, for a lot of years did did really poorly this year or much you know not as well just due the to the conditions so um it probably depends on what the what the factors are but um if it, it if it really doesn't do well at all i'd probably yeah be do if i did it again it would be a small amount just but yeah it's hard to evaluate things just with one year only gunther what do you do just it doesn't work out you ah, get that stuff out of here uh what do you do it depends how badly it uh, performs. Uh, you know, if if it's a real flop, uh, and everything else around the farm and and in the area did really well, uh, then no, we're not going back to it. If uh, you know, if it's off a little bit, others have had success. Uh, you, you analyze why it wasn't quite there. Uh, you know, we'll we'll give it another go. Uh, like this year, for example, L345, you know, was really hyped up as the greatest thing since sliced bread. And don't get me wrong, it's a really good variety. It, uh, But because of all the hype when I grew it, it, it didn't really uh, perform that much better than 233, I thought. Uh, however, you know, I have friends uh, that next year they will only grow 345 because they were so impressed with it. We will also grow it again. Uh, you can't um, you can't just diss that variety because of one year where it didn't perform like they said it would. It was equally as good as 233. Some fields it was better. Uh, one field it was uh, worse. So it's, yeah, it's not a bad variety. 
Yeah, for sure. Hey, gang, we are we are totally out of time. Uh, this has been a really, really fun discussion. Thanks to everybody in the audience for participating in the Q&A. Greatly appreciated. We got some great insight from our expert panelists today as well. Hey, Harold, thanks a lot for your time and insights, and it's uh, great hearing from you. Thanks so much. And, Gunther, enjoy winter. I know you will enjoy that cold so much. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, stuck at home. <laughs> hey, uh, Terry, great to see you. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Uh, enjoyed the discussion. It was great. It was. I agree very much. We're glad you could join today's webinar, uh, and we want to extend a thank you to those who shared their questions for the panelists. We'd also like to offer our thanks to our guests for sharing their knowledge, experience, and expertise. We hope you found their presentations very, very informative. I know I did. We'd like to hear what you thought of today's webinar, so if you could take a minute to answer the brief survey, You'll see when you exit the webinar, that would be great. And for those of you who are certified crop advisors, you are eligible to receive continuing education credit for attending this webinar. Thanks again for attending, everybody. We wish you all the best in the coming season, and enjoy your winter.